All right, y'all, so let's talk about coronavirus and what role libraries can play in dealing with its impacts. My name's Peter, and this is Stacks and Facts. All right, y'all, so I'm just going to jump into this. So let's cover the basics first. You've probably heard it called coronavirus, but its actual name as of early February is COVID-19. This is an important distinction to make because COVID-19 is a kind of coronavirus, just like how a crow is a kind of bird. Other examples of coronaviruses include the common cold, SARS, and MERS, and what all four of these have in common, as some of their names suggest, is their shape. They are all spiky, like crowns, and they mostly affect our respiratory system, so how we breathe. But COVID-19 is closer to the common cold in the majority of people who catch it than it is to SARS or MERS. For the overwhelming majority of folks, it will be inconvenient, but not life-threatening. The most common symptoms are a fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath. And for most people, that's it, and it lasts about two weeks. While it can lead to pneumonia or other more severe symptoms, at the other end, its symptoms can be mild or even non-existent. So while there have been around 90,000 confirmed cases worldwide as of now, which is early March of 2020 for all of you time travelers out there, the actual number of people who've caught COVID-19 may be a lot higher, which makes accurate statistics around mortality hard to come up with. Also, while we're talking about statistics, uh, there's a number that hasn't gotten a lot of coverage, and that is current active cases. As of today, over half of the cases that we know about have recovered, putting the current active cases worldwide at just under 44,000. And each day, more people are recovering than are getting sick by a pretty significant rate, so it's not all doom and gloom. Which is a natural segue into the question that I think most people want answered. Am I in danger? I mean, not like me, Peter, but like you, the viewer, or the library patron. And the simple answer is probably not. Here's what we know. So far, there have been about 110 cases in the US and Canada combined. That comes out to be approximately 0.00003% of the population, I think, math not being my strong suit. Um, but those most at risk for serious complications have pre-existing conditions already, like heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and other immune system compromising conditions. This also happens to line up with age. People under 50 who typically have fewer pre-existing conditions are at a much lower risk than those 50 or older of complications. Women are less likely to catch it than men are, and it tends to be less dangerous for women when they do. Go figure. Uh, it isn't super clear to me if that's because of something biological or because of differences in behavior between men and women, but probably both to some degree. Uh, and at least as of mid-February, there haven't been any recorded deaths of children under 10, which, like, I'm going to count as a win. So, with all of that in mind, if we look at everyone as a big group, the fatality rate of COVID-19 is estimated at somewhere between 8 and 35 out of every thousand people who catch it. That's between 0.8 and 3.5%. But again, the healthier you are, the lower that likelihood is. If you're 33 and in good health, like moi, the mortality rate drops to around 0.2% or even lower, uh, and I put links to more information about the disease and stats in the description. Some things we don't know for sure about the disease are where exactly it came from, how exactly it can spread, and what the odds of catching it are if you're exposed, but scientists suspect that it started off in another animal and then jumped into humans. This is a phenomenon known as zoonosis. While we aren't 100% on all of the ways a person can catch it, we do know for sure that the virus can be transmitted when respiratory droplets that have the virus, so basically tiny little drops of spit that come out when we sneeze or talk or cough, come into contact with our eyes, nose, or mouth, our mucous membranes. These droplets are too heavy to stay in the air for long, so you'd have to be right next to someone who's sick to catch it that way. But these droplets will settle on something like a keyboard, so if you touch the keyboard and then your face, you run the risk of catching it that way too. Scientists are still trying to determine exactly how long the virus can be transmissible while on surfaces, but for now, the best way to deal with that is to wash your hands early and often. Now, as for wearing face masks, they won't do a good job at keeping you from getting sick because respiratory droplets are so small that they can pass right through them. But if you are sick, wearing a mask can help keep others safe by catching the bigger droplets. And that's what we know so far, except for whatever new information came out between me releasing this video and you watching it. So what do we do? 
Well, our two main roles in libraries are one, to help people understand the reality of the situation, and two, do what we can to reduce the spread of the disease in our own environments. One thing we've been seeing a lot of is fear, which makes sense. Humans tend to fear the unknown because that's what's kept us alive historically. And considering that this is a brand new disease to humans, that's about as unknown as it gets. This fear can manifest in things like panic buying supplies and avoiding activities that you usually enjoy, or it can lead to something darker. Since COVID-19 has entered public awareness, racist attacks and ignorance towards folks who look like they might be Asian have spiked around the world. See, for example, this, and this, and this, and this. And none of this is okay. As library workers, we're in a position to provide the right information to people whether that's in answering a reference question, or collecting and providing resources to the public, or tailoring our programming to suit our community's needs. Here are some examples. First, think of the children. Kids hear adults talk, they hear the news, and they talk to each other at school. And like, honestly, sometimes they're jerks about it. So there are probably some kids out there who are scared too. If you do story times, consider books talking about the importance of treating people different from us with kindness, or a book about how when you get sick, you get better too. NPR editor and strategist Malika Garib put together an excellent webcomic written specifically to help kids understand COVID-19, and I left a link in the description. It covers all of the important bases, is written in language that kids can understand, and my favorite thing of all, get this, it can even be printed and turned into a zine super easily. Aside from things you can read, there are also things that you can do. Incorporate some imagination play into your story time, bring out some plastic buckets, and pretend that there are sinks to practice washing hands in. You can also teach kids to cough and sneeze into their elbows like this. <coughs> it's like dabbing. Uh, or you can teach them the thousand variations of the fist bump to minimize contact. Uh, my personal favorite is the jellyfish where you go like this. But the, the point of all of this is to give kids a sense of agency. If you can help them feel like there's something that they can do, it'll help them feel less hopeless and potentially lead to some great habits as adults. Now, while we're talking about adults, maybe now would be a good time to invite someone from the local health authority or hospital or university to do a Q&A about communicable diseases. There's a lot of misinformation out there, so bringing in a known expert from the community can go a long way to helping deal with that. In fact, let me, let me tell you a story. So, at my local library, I occasionally facilitate an ESL conversation circle, ESL being English as a second language, and we do this for newcomers so that they can come practice English in an environment that's friendly to them. Um, so partly because I was writing the script for this video, I decided that this week's session uh, we would talk about health to give folks a chance to air their concerns and, you know, learn something useful. So I printed off a bunch of copies of Malika's comic and handed them out, and we read it, and we talked about it, and let me tell you, it was amazing. One of the attendees happened to be a pediatrician, uh, which was super helpful, and everyone was really engaged, and at the end of it, so many of the folks were so appreciative and relieved that someone actually took the time to help them understand what's going on. And like, you know, isn't, isn't that what we should be aiming for? Spoilers, yes, it is. But as for programming, it doesn't just have to be around health either. Uh, the stock market just lost a bunch of value last week, and so it's probably a good time to do some financial literacy offerings as well. Just putting it out there. Now, those are all some ideas to help make sure that people have the right information, so let's talk about how we can reduce the spread of the disease in our libraries. Now's the time to be especially vigilant in cleaning surfaces. We're in a bit of a pickle at the moment because libraries are very much a hands-on experience, and while we can't be perfect, we can do our best. And in fact, I dare say we have to do our best because a big chunk of our patrons, our seniors, are indeed really vulnerable to this disease. So, first, make sure the terminals and other surfaces get cleaned regularly. Obviously, we can't take the time to clean every computer after every single use, but we can get things disinfected more than we already do. Maybe once in the morning, once in the afternoon, and once in the evening. Two, give folks agency and peace of mind by making hand sanitizer visibly and readily available. It might get expensive, but it won't be as expensive as staff getting sick or the library shutting down because people are freaking out about an outbreak. And three, if you get sick, stay home. And if your staff get sick, do whatever you can to facilitate them staying home. Now, listen, I know, I know that's a real bougie thing to say when we look at the reality of employment and funding in libraries. 
I personally don't get sick time either, and every day that I don't work means that it's that much harder for me to stay housed. But, again, we work with vulnerable populations, and we have a responsibility to them. Now is a great time to go to your library boards and unions and talk about how precarity in libraries already puts people at risk, since most staff can't afford to take time off when they're sick. It already costs so much more money in the long run than cutting benefits and being permanently short-staffed saves. Until we have truly adequate universal health care and worker protections, we're putting our communities at risk to save a few bucks. Are you, if you are in a position of leadership, willing to live with the consequence of that if, or more likely when, this becomes a pandemic? Well, I got dark real fast, didn't it? And like, I don't want to scare anyone, but I think that we have to walk a very tricky line of managing people's expectations. Right now, things sound a lot scarier than they probably are, but that doesn't mean that that won't change. So what else can we do in libraries to help with the current situation? Leave your comments below, tweet at me, or just like shout your ideas into the ether. Something's got to stick. Um, comment, like, and subscribe. And thank you for watching. And until next time, don't forget to ask questions. All right. Bye, y'all.